Welcome to the Aircon Vault, recordings of the live streams from Airwiggles Audio Conference. These are made free thanks to our sponsors, a sound effect, Game Audio Learning, Kilohertz, Audio Kinetic, Sound Cuts, Tsugi, Boom Library, Sound Warriors, and Airwiggles, the online home for audio people. This is going to be a talk on haptics uh, and game audios. So let's get right into it. Um, first off, who am I? Uh, my name is David Tucker. I've been a C++ programmer for 25 years and a game developer for the last 15. Um, I work at a company called iRacing. We make a multiplayer sim racing game for the PC. Um, and I handle, among other things, I handle the communications between the game and the peripherals. So controllers, force feedback wheels, keyboards, space shakers, telemetry, and so on. And in the past, I've done some of the audio development. Um, so right off the bat, what is haptics? So haptics is a way to provide tactile feedback from uh, to the player from your game. So it's a it's a touch thing. Um, it triggers both the cutaneous, that's your skin, and kinesthesia, or your muscle systems. Um, and it can provide a sense of temperature, texture, slip, vibration, pressure, location, motion, force, or compliance to your body. So for our uses uh, in video games, it's typically referring to using some sort of a motor to provide vibrotactile feedback about an event in our environment. Um, this talk is going to be broken down into several parts. I'm going to give a quick overview of haptic style devices. Uh, then I'm going to give some hints on how best to drive these devices. Um, and a brief introduction to DSPs and signal generators. And then an outline of how I generate the haptics for iRacing. So um, before we get lost in the technical details, I wanted to spend a little moment to kind of hype this up. I really feel that haptics is the next big, th big thing coming into video games. Um, it's been available for a very long time now, but we have developers haven't really taken much advantage of it. Um, I think with faster computers, more CPU time for audio, and much better physics engines, we can do a lot more with it than we've ever have in the past. And the hardware is improved greatly and getting better all the time. And the prices have come down, so it's it's affordable now to get haptic devices. So um, the aim of haptics is to bring our players into the game and make them feel immersed rather than just passively watching a great movie. So in our game, uh, the players that have been using our haptics systems, they often tell me that they can't use the game anymore without it. So if their haptics turns off, it feels stale. So the main goal of this talk is to inspire you as developers to make your own dedicated low-frequency sound mix into your projects. I think if we provide strong haptic feedback in all of our games, then users will be inspired to add the necessary hardware, and we can make this a must-have accessory for gaming. So that's my main goal, is to get everybody to do this. I think it's worth it. So there are three major types of haptic devices that are commercially available and commonly found. So those that are driven by a motor with an eccentric weight, sometimes called the pager motor. Uh, those that are driven by a tactile transducer or voice coil driven. And those that use a servo motor, and sometimes uh, such as force feedback devices or motion platforms. Um, the eccentric mate weight style actuators, uh, these use an offset weight attached to a motor to create a vibration. So almost anything that you have used that vibrates uses this method. So these are very one-dimensional devices. You can only directly change the frequency of rotation. And the intensity is tied to frequency. So increasing frequency increases the intensity as well. They're also very low fidelity devices. They don't usually provide a very linear response. They tend to be sticky, and they're really slow to turn on and off. So some example devices include the vibrating motors found in most of your game pads, uh, the vibration found in phones and smartwatches, uh, a lot of wheel rims, uh, pedals, shifters, and joysticks have um, vibrating motors built into them. And then um, if you remember from 10 or so years ago, there were a bunch of vibrating game seat pads that you can buy. Um, these usually come free with a device. Consumers are rarely setting out to buy a vibration-enabled device. But most users will have some sort of pager motor style device that you can program. So they're very common and very, and we need to deal with them. Um, next up is a tactile transducer. So these are based around a voice coil, some sort of a moving weight 
and a suspension to keep it all tied together. Uh, you send audio into the transducer and that is converted directly into vibrations. These take in both a frequency and an intensity, so they're a multidimensional effect. Um, and they can play many different frequencies at the same time, so they're also multitonal as well. They have a lot more fidelity than pager motor style devices, and they can run over a very broad range of frequencies. But for our uses, we're typically interested in the 20 to 200 hertz range. What they cannot do is produce a DC bias. That is, they can only produce momentary impacts or continuous vibrations, but they can't produce a constant pressure against your skin. Um, the moving weight in these can be quite large. There's one common transducer that uses a three pound weight. That's like a, a roofing hammer being hit against your body. Um, these go by name, many, many different names. Um, they're called base shakers, exciters, tactile transducers, haptic actuators, butt kickers, but they're all more or less the same device. So you don't get lost in the naming. Um, and finally, I really like to think of these as tactile speakers. That means they need an amp and a sound card and they use all the usual audio rules apply on how to drive them. So uh, example devices are the bass shaker, the butt kickers that everybody thinks of. Um, the Sony PS5 controller has little mini tactile transducers built into it instead of pager motors. Uh, modern vibrating seat pads will have little mini tactile transducers built into them. And then the force vest that we've always been trying to, to make happen. Well, it's a tactile device. Um, these usually range in the hundred to four hundred dollar range. Uh, the price ranges in the hundred to four hundred dollar range. So they're they're accessible, but they're not cheap exactly. And finally, we have uh, the servo motor based systems. So if you use a motor, some sort of a position encoder, and an end effector that can push against you, um, you can apply a force or resistance to the user in a controlled way. Um, these have the ability to both apply constant pressure, which is a DC bias, as well as resist motion. And they can simulate most any physical property you can think of, such as friction, damping, and inertia. Um, they're capable of playing back effects above the DC range and often can replicate the same vibrations that a tactile transducer can produce. However, the moving masses on these devices tend to be quite heavy, and that limits the upper range of their frequency response. So a motion platform is going to struggle to produce a 200 hertz tone, for example. Um, finally, on force feedback devices, interfaces like direct input struggle to replicate the high frequencies because we as programmers have to have very tightly controlled loops to output one sample at a time very precisely to not destroy the, the frequency. Um, there are new APIs like Logitech's TrueForce or Fanatec's for Full Force that let you send an audio signal to the force feedback devices uh, in addition to the regular signal from the physics. Um, so some examples include uh, force feedback steering wheels, force feedback joysticks, uh, motion platforms, um, a device called the G-seat where you use paddles to press against the side of your body to simulate uh, motion. Uh, there's force feedback pedals coming onto the market. And then the resistive triggers in the Sony PS5 controller, a very low cost version of a force feedback device. Um, the cost of a force feedback wheel runs between $300 and $2,000. Um, and hobbyist level motion is in the $2,000 to $10,000 range. So it's much more expensive. Um, in our industry, everybody that's driving with a force feedback wheel is some, something like 95% of our users have force feedback. So the, the, in addition to these kind of common devices, there's plenty of other options out there, um, they, but they're not really easy to find. So you can use a solenoid to move a weight like with a time crisis gun at the arcade. You can use air bladders to apply pressure to various parts of your body. You can use heat or wind. You know, in our uh, game, there's a lot of users that do seatbelt tensioners to simulate being thrown into the seat belts when you break. Um, these are all fascinating and they're definitely worth looking into, but they're not broadly available to most gamers. They're gonna be custom things targeted at one type of game or, or one-offs. So for this talk, um, I'm mostly going to be focused in on the tactile transducer and to a small extent, the eccentric weight style actuators. 
uh, servo motor style actuators are best suited to being driven by the physics engine, and they don't usually mess as nice, mesh nicely with audio. However, you can sometimes use audio to complement force feedback signals, such as with the Logitech TrueForce API. And in that case, you can just take your tactile transducer signal, feed it to the wheel with very little modification. So haptics is audio. So I believe Vibro Tactile Haptics belongs to the audio developer and not to the programmer. Um, if you think of haptic devices as an extension of audio, then they all fit together very well. Audio typically operates in the 50 to 8,000 hertz range, but your ears are not very sensitive to the lower frequency audio. Instead, you usually feel the audio on your skin. Tactile transducers are able to produce very strong vibrations in the 20 to 200 hertz range. Some can go well above 200 hertz, but that starts to act more like a speaker and, the vi and less like a vibration device at around 100 hertz. And a few devices can get all the way down to five hertz. So force feedback devices can take this even lower, of course. They can get all the way down to zero hertz. Um, pager motor style actuators can't be driven directly by audio, but you can envelope an audio signal and send the magnitude to the pager motor. I use this in my own code to downgrade a signal I would normally send to a tactile transducer for use with a pager motor style actuator. And it's important to realize that haptics is similar to audio, but it's not truly audio. It activates different receptors in your body via, via vibration. And this is a benefit. You can feel vibration on your hands or your back independent from similar sounding from the audio signal. And this provides another way to differentiate effects without making the audio too cluttered. So here's some audio hints. Um, like I said before, you're looking to complement, not replicate audio. Most audio is well above the frequency range of a tactile transducer, so playing a broad spectrum sound like a gunshot through the transducer will have little effect. But playing a pulse through the transducer in combination with the gunshot sound will give the user a positive reinforcement that lets them know the gun did in fact fire. Um, haptics can allow deaf and hard of hearing users to get more enjoyment from the game. Our, um, we have a lot of positive feedback on that in our game. Um, haptics can be driven with a series of... Uh, so. I, Haptics can be driven with a series of DSPs and tone generators as in a synthesizer style. That's how I do it. Or you can use pre-recorded audio samples and make a mix. Or you can even get uh, uh, an accelerometer and record actual um, vibrations from real devices and play those back to great effect. Um, so there are some downsides that we have to work over, uh, overcome. So the haptics hardware is not as high fidelity as we would like it to be at this stage. I, I like to compare it to speakers from the 50s. It, you know, the, you know, all the paper cone stuff that was kind of falling apart if you tried to play bass through it. Um, a lot of the lower cost transducers are incapable of producing vibrations below 40 or even sometimes 60 hertz. So uh, I found that if I added harmonics to my signal, um, you can energize those transducers with the same mix that you might use for when you're targeting a better quality transducer. Um, the transducer picture to the left is an example of one that's not behaving well. Uh, this one has a strong resonant frequency at 60 hertz with a dramatic fall off below that frequency. Uh, um, so you can see that the, there's really no amount of energy that's going to get it to, to go down to 40 hertz. And then that that uh, harmonic is something you want to avoid. So yes, yeah, so um, someone's asking, can haptics help the visually impaired? And, and I don't think it's uh, something that could help them directly. I mean, any any additional feedback is always good, but uh, uh, it's a, it's a whole other problem, and, and someday we should give a talk on that trying to, to help the visually impaired. Um, so, all right. So um, because the haptic devices are varied, um, some have better frequency response, some have worse. Um, because the systems that they're trying to vibrate have different weight masses to them, different damping to them, different resonant uh, frequencies, you're going to have to provide the user some sort of way to mix their haptics, uh, at least to a limited amount. So I provide a mix, 
of the each effect is has one uh, is I group the effects into into you know I take my effects and group them into groups and and I provide a limited mix uh, where they can duck the volume a little bit per effect um, and this helps them adapt it to their system so they get the most out of the system. Um, in an ideal world, we would just send an a haptic mix just like we send an audio mix without letting them mess around, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, bass shakers themselves are prone to overheating. Um, they're very inefficient. You're, you're using basically levitation to drive vibration. It's not a very efficient system. Um, so you want to be filtering out as much noise from the signal as possible that's not adding to the core vibration um, so that the shakers don't have excess heat pumped into them. Uh, it's especially important that we um, filter out the high frequency noise and the DC bias. Uh, shakers can not effectively reproduce these and it adds a lot of energy into the shaker. Um, um, finally, being smooth is really important. Uh, you don't want any sharp edges in your signals. If you fed a square wave into a tactile transducer, it'll cause it to bottom out and produce a loud clunk. If you feed a square wave into a motion platform or force feedback device, it could result in physical injury. So you want to fade in and out all your effects, just like you do with good audio programming. For force feedback devices, you really want to go a step further, and you want to add some sort of a limiter or suppressor at the end of your chain so that if the signal is out of shape, um, you just turn it off. So like in our case, if a vehicle crashes, um, we suppress the signal during the crash so that we're not actually hurting anybody. So uh, to really take advantage of haptics, you want to have a rich set of data to drive things with. If you're just passing a few binary states on, it'll feel mechanical and uninspired, and your users will get tired of the effects really quickly. Um, in our game, we have access to a very complex physics engine, so we can pull out movements of the tires over the ground, detailed information on engine RPM and loading, tire grip, and of course, particles. Um, this makes the whole system much more dynamic and rich. It's very nice. Um, and ideally, haptics is another way to give feedback feedback to the user on how the game is going. So being able to feel the engine of the spaceship rumble and surge when you're accelerating or feeling the lack of recoil when your gun jams allows you to feel, feed more information to your user without overloading the already full audio landscape. So if you're doing this right, you should be able to play the game without audio and still get by. Um, in our game, we can feel when it's time to shift, feel the tires starting to slide, feel when the shift was successful, and even feel impacts when we bump into other cars or hit a curb. And it's quite easy to drive successfully, successfully using only the haptics feedback without any audio at all. And that shows that the signal is rich and vibrant and we're doing a good job of mixing it. So uh, we're gonna get into some more technical stuff now. Um, I drive my system with DSPs. Um, so I'm going to share with you how I did my uh, haptic system, but uh, th there's many ways to do it. I just want to make that clear up front. So DSPs combined with a signal generator are a great way to drive haptics. The dynamic range of haptic devices tend to be, tends to be quite low, so you don't need the full fidelity of pre-recorded audio. Um, DSPs can be more dynamic as well because they're able to smoothly adjust to changes in the underlying signal that the games provide. Um, you don't have to pitch shift audio samples. The DSP can just generate a new tone or, or ramp up and down tones easily. So the following section, I'm gonna be lightly talking about programming DSPs. However, this could all be replicated with a synthesizer or most any audio system like FMOD. Programming is not required. If you get the basic concepts, then you can make it work with any tool set. You don't need a degree in electrical engineering to figure this out. So right off the bat, I think you want to use decibels for the volume. Um, I've looked through a lot of literature on this, trying to figure out what the optimal uh, signal range is for your skin, but it, it seems to follow a logarithmic um, curve, just like your ears. Um, and I don't, I don't have an exact number of what's the best practices, but the 20 log 10 seems to be a good, uh, seems to work well. It feels very linear when you're ramping up and down your volume. So you don't want to directly manipulate gain you want, or magnitude. You want to use a, a logarithm. Um, so you want to be mixing your audio in floats with a plus or minus one range when you're doing DSP work. 
Um, that just makes the math come out perfect. Um, without that, you're doing a lot of work all the time trying to, to rebalance things and keep it from growing unbounded. And um, as you're working through your DSPs and your signal generators and you're making uh, mixes of them, you want to make sure that at every stage you're continuing to output a signal at unity at plus or minus one. Um, that, uh, and then and then do your final mix down at the very end of the stage. So kind of think of it like an audio uh, mixer console where you, you're keeping your signal levels high all the way through and then you're doing a, a final mix down. Um, that helps you as you're developing to know that you're doing everything right. It can helps you not uh, accidentally start saturating signals and coming up with a real mess later on. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a small thing, but it's a, it's a big deal. As you're generating each effect, try to take a look at it with a loopback device and make sure that the audio is in a reasonable range and not saturating or not really quiet. So DSPs themselves are a complex topic, but at their core, they're really simple. They just take one sample in, they process it, and they output one sample. And in the process, they can generate a tone or modify the frequency response or any number of other effects. So typically, you'd initialize a DSP with a sample rate in hertz. That allows you to use units of time or frequency without worrying about what the underlying update rate is. Um, so no more uh, making loops and stalling for three or four ticks. You, you just say, I want this to run at 10 hertz or, or for three seconds and, and, and let the math deal with itself. Um, and it's useful to keep in mind that one over hertz is seconds and one over seconds is hertz. So we can quickly translate back and forth between hertz and time. So uh, let's get into some of the DSPs that we're going to use. So the, the simplest one is a signal generator. So, um, I mean, this is a white noise generator. So we're just going to take a random number uh, scale it between minus one and one and output it and now we have white noise. It's, it's really not hard. Um, and then you can take that white noise and filter it any way you want with the lower high pass filter to color it. So our, our noise generator does nothing other than just generate random noise. Um, next up is a sine wave generator. This is going to be the core effect that we're going to use for everything. Um, and the important thing here is that we're tracking the phase of the sine wave. So this allows you to modify the frequency at any time um, without generating some sort of a discontinuity or a pop. If you just, uh, if you didn't track the phase, then every time you change your frequency, you're going to hear a little click. And if you're doing it a lot, you're, it's going to sound like there's marbles in your, in your effect. You're going to hear just clicks all over the place. Um, so if you look at this, it's not, it's not too hard. Um, So uh, this 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 uh, effect is going to take a initialization function. It's going to take in a sample rate in hertz, the frequency of the sine wave that we want to generate, and some sort of magnitude. In this case, again in decibels. Um, we're going to have some extra functions that can change the frequency at any time or the gain at any time, and those don't do any math. They just directly set those values. And then the core of it is going to be this process step. So every tick, every time through the sample rate, we're going to just take our last phase, calculate uh, the new phase based on the current sample rate and, and frequency, and, and then run that through the sine function and scale it. Um, if you did this in real life, you're going to want to clamp it to plus or minus pi because the phase will grow out of bounds and, and end up saturating the float. So the next uh, filter that we really want to have is a fade filter. Um, fade filters are super easy. They fade something in uh, or fade it out. And the key is that you don't have to do all the thinking yourself. You, you can just set a function to say turn on or turn off. Um, so this is very useful for transitioning effect on or off without having to do all the work yourself. And if you, if you didn't use a fade filter, if you just started or stopped a loop, um, you risk making a pop which can be felt uh, because the, you don't know where the sample is going to start or stop in, in its cycle. 
Um, and then it's important to realize that a fade filter is not an effect directly. It doesn't generate a tone. You, you have to take the fade filter and multiply it against an actual tone to fade that tone in and out. So here's some pseudocode for a fade filter. Um, a fade filter is going to have four states. It's going to be fading in, it's going to be on, it's going to be fading out, or it's going to be off. Uh, called a fade in or fade out will begin the transition to each of the states. And I found that a linear ramp works good enough. Um, you can experiment with more complicated ramping, uh, but it, for the for, for what we're doing, it seems to be fine. Um, and then note that this doesn't output a signal from plus or minus one. It's just from zero to one because it's modifying a signal. And it never goes above one or below zero. So what, again, we're going to have an initialization function that's going to take a sample rate. And it's going to take a duration for how long the fade is going to last you know, to fade in or out. And you're going to want to set that duration to be long enough to make sure that there's no pop or, or, or issue, but not so long that, that people really notice the fade. So a half second is probably good. Um, and then, um, right. So um, what we're going to do uh, by default, we're going to have our fade filter turned off. So we've set our gain to zero and we've got this function, this parameter fade sign that's set to minus one. And that's going to tell us that we're fading out. Um, there's two function calls, fade in and fade out. You can call them at any time and it'll it'll start the process of, of ramping in or out the signal. And then in our process step function, we're just going to take our previous gain, increment it by uh, the math needed to, to take the next step in the time allotted, and then clamp it to plus or minus one. So there's really nothing much to it. It's super easy. Um, with a little bit of work, you could make this a crossfade instead, but I really think that should be another function that you make. Um, crossfades needs special math to make sure that um, as you're transitioning from one signal to the other, the power remains constant. It's not hard, but it's worth looking up and making that its own thing. So next up is going to be an envelope filter. So an envelope filter ramps the game up and back down using a half sine wave. Um, and this is very useful for making short impulse effects that only last a moment. You can multiply, again, multiply the envelope with any other signal to ramp it smoothly on and off, just like a fade filter. Um, and it's very simpler, similar to the fade filter, but it works better for short, short pulse events. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, more efficient than a straight ramp and it produces less high energy, uh, high frequency leakage. So in this uh, picture here, there's a red dashed line that, that represents the incoming signal. So in this case, it's just a pure sine wave, but it could be anything. Um, there's a green dashed line that represents the envelope filter. That's the, the signal we're generating. And when you multiply the two together, you end up with the blue line. And you can see that no matter where the signal was at in its position, um, it is starting at zero and ending at zero, fading in and out. And then in the middle, it's got full magnitude. So the math here is not that hard again. Um, this looks an awful lot like our sine wave generator. Um, again, we're taking a sample rate, some time limit du duration for the, the pulse, and then a magnitude. Um, we're going to leave it turned off by default. So um, well, so our phase is going to be set to 2 pi, which is the end of our, of our ramp. And then... Um, we're going to use that trick we mentioned before where frequency is one over duration so that we can directly use frequency to set our signal. So we're going to have a trigger function and all that does is set the phase back to zero and then the process is just going to slowly march phase across from zero to two pi. And um, we've adjusted the math just a tiny bit to make sure that we're using only the positive side of a sine wave. Um, because the sine function doesn't start at zero, it starts at one. So uh, here's a compound effect. So uh, like I said before, not all base shakers respond to the same frequency range. Some can run quite low all the way down to five hertz, while others can't, below six, can't go below 60 hertz. And by adding harmonics to the signal, um, you can excite the weaker shakers with the same the signal that you use to excite the more capable shakers. And that lets you do less work trying to come up with a mix that works for all devices. Um, I find that it's best to place the harmonics in the pocket right below the fundamental so that you're not really noticing them 
when the fundamental is available, but when the fundamental goes away, it's still enough power to actually generate uh, something the user can feel. So in this case, we're going to use three sine wave generators. Um, one is going to be at the fundamental frequency. Um, one's going to be at twice the fundamental frequency, and, one, and the last one at four times the fundamental frequency, and then the volumes are going to be at 0 dB, minus 6 dB, and minus 12 dB. And then on our process step, we're just going to calculate those three frequencies and sum them together. And then we do this weird thing where we divide through by 1.75. So the 1.75 is there because if you call the dB to wave function that we listed earlier, um, dB to wave of 0 dB it returns a value of 1. A dB to wave of minus 6 dB returns a value of 0.5. And dB to wave of minus 12 dB returns a value of 0.25. So if you sum those three numbers together, you get 1.75. And that's a measure of how much energy we are generating. So by adding three sine waves together, we're generating more than a unity. You know, we're, we're increasing the volume. So we need to divide back through by 1.75 to bring the volume back down to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to unity, to one. Otherwise, uh, when we substitute this in for our normal sine wave, it, it'll be louder. And we'll have to readjust our mix. So it's beyond this talk to talk about the math needed to make an impulse response filter, but um, the code's not difficult and there's plenty of books out there that, that'll tell you how to do it. And chances are any tool you're using already has these built in. Um, at a minimum, I think you should have access to a high pass, low pass, or a band, and a band pass filter. Um, a low pass filter can be used to silence shakers by cutting frequencies above 200 Hertz or, or whatever starts to make noise. A uh, high-pass filter can be used to remove the DC bias from the signal so that it's more power efficient. Um, and a band pass can be used to select a narrow frequency range from a broad spectrum signal to color it in any way you want. Um, so uh, those are all our building blocks. So we're, let's build up some... Um, effects. So the following is going to be a real rough overview of some of the effects that we use in our game. Um, but things have been greatly simplified to make this talk easier to understand. But hopefully it gives you some inspiration on how you could go about building up these kinds of effects. So as we go through these, notice that often we're using real world physics to help identify how these effects should be modeled. Um, so if you can figure out even roughly how the physics might work in the real world, it's very easy to generate these tones um, based on the, the math. So our game has a complex physics engine that runs at a fast enough speed that we can pull data straight from the physics and play it back as audio. So if your physics engine um, was running at, say, 400 hertz, that would be plenty fast enough to play a 200 hertz tone, which is the upper range of our vibrations that we're looking for. Um, so once this variable is the acceleration that the car body experiences as it bounces over curves, um, this value um, is in some weird units that the physics people care about, like uh, Newton meters. And you can't directly feed that into the audio. So it needs to be rescaled in, into the plus or minus one audio range that we are interested in. Um, you're probably going to do this in the real world with limiters and compressors and, and other audio tools. But as a simple idea, you could just take what, whatever you think the loudest impact should be and whatever that value would be, you just divide through, divide your signal through by that, and that'll rescale things to zero to one, to a percent. Um, once you've got it into an audio range, um, you're going to um, run it through a high pass filter to remove the DC bias, because this is a random signal. You don't know what the state is. It, it, if the car was accelerating through a corner, it might constantly be outputting minus one or something. Um, and that's no good for our, our shakers. That's just adding heat. Um, and then you need to make sure to clamp the signal because, again, it's coming from the physics. You don't know what's going through. You know, you, you may think the signal is always going to stay below your, your limit, but it, uh, it, it, you know, something could blow up and you, and you don't want this to go above one. Um, and finally, the, the physics engine is going to be outputting a signal at a fairly low bit rate. Um, whatever it is, it's not nearly as fast as you're running your audio. So you're going to need to upsample the signal in some way. 
Um, one trick is that you don't need to make your audio mix at 44 kilohertz, right? We're, we're dealing with very low frequencies here. So you can, if it makes the math easier, you can take your physics bit rate, your physics update rate, and multiply that by some e even number and make that your audio rate. You know, so maybe you, you run your audio at 10 times the physics rate. Um, and then you can use simple um, upsamplers based around that. Um, and then and then that's it. You just play it back as audio. So this is really easy. Uh, so so this can provide really rich feedback um, if you get it balanced correctly. So like in our game, when it's working right, you can really feel every little bump in the tr track. And we don't have to code anything for that. It's just there free in the physics, you know. So uh, recently we put in new um, higher resolution curbing, and all of a sudden we're able to, you know, the, the force feed, the haptic system is just able to pick up on those higher resolution curbs. So, um, you know, we're able to feel every little div divot in the curbing. It, it worked out really great. Um, but this is easy to say, and it's really hard to do. So think of the, um, getting everything balanced right so that the signal is strong enough that every shaker can reproduce it, but not so strong that it's saturating all the time is a real trick. So I like to think of it the same as how you might mix a drum kit, right? It, your drum kit's got this overwhelming array of audio and you have to put limiters and compressors on it to try to tease out the exciting stuff without blowing out your microphone. And it's the same thing here. You, you wanna um, you know, use all your audio tricks to get this into a range that, that works well. So um, in our game, we've got four stroke engines and four-stroke engines, if you do the math or read papers up on it, um, four-stroke engines tend to produce three major vibrations. They're all multiples of the engine RPM. So this varies with the number of cylinders because each configuration has a different firing pattern per revolution. Um, you know, the, the each, you know, the however many cylinders are attached to the, you know, the cylinders are all attached to the same crank. So they're fixed together that, you know, Cylinder one fires, and cylinder three, then two, then four, whatever. Um, so uh, again, this is a good case where we're looking up the math. Um, is very useful. Um, we can just find somebody's paper on how engines work and and pull out some details, and and there we go. We've got we've got the the um, the we know how to set this up without having to guess at it. So. Um, so right off the bat, we're going to pass in from the from the physics. We're going to get an engine RPM and a cylinder count. Um, the engine RPM is going to be much too high for our uses. If you just did the math and ran it through, you know, uh, some modern F1 engines can rev up to 15,000 RPM, and, and that's going to produce audio way beyond the 200 hertz limit that we've got for our shakers. So right off the bat, we're going to need to do some math to rescale the audio back down into a frequency, the RPM back down into a frequency range that will generate audio in, um, in the range that our shakers can handle. Now, when you're doing that, you want to be careful to rescale it in such a way that the, the new shaker vibration data is harmonious with the actual engine sound, so you're not creating a dissonant effect. Um, so, and then, as we said, um, I'm not going to go through the math real carefully, but you know, we, we've done some, you know, we've gone out, we've looked at a paper, we figured out that we have these three frequencies. So we're just going to generate three frequencies, uh, doing a little math based on our RPM and sum them together. And again, um, after we sum them together, we're going to divide through by 2.12. And that's just the minus 5 dB plus the 0 dB plus the minus 5 dB. Uh, so minus 5 dB is, is equivalent to 6.62. Um, and 0 dB is equivalent to 1, so well, you add it all together, it adds up to 2.12. Um, and that's just to make sure that, again, everything's staying at unity. We're not, our, our engine effect is not generating more power than it should. Um, we're going to take it further. We're going to build some function that's going to look at engine RPM, the engine load, any other data we can get for our physics and set and adjust the overall volume after we've done our initial mix. Um, and then we're going to run the whole thing through a low pass to eliminate any higher frequency harmonics uh, that we're not interested in. Um, so this can be extended 
um, this is this is a very simple example. You can extend it with engine load, a starter effect, backfires, engine shutoff. There's all kinds of neat things you can do here. And then I'd like to point out that uh, um, you can actually measure this stuff. So if you take your phone, it's got an accelerometer built into it, and you can find an FFT program to run on your phone. And that'll let you just touch your phone to anything, and you can see the, the fundamental frequencies uh, of vibration. So I actually did this myself with, with an actual car. I sat there, set my phone on the engine carefully and, um, you know, revved the engine up and, and was able to, to verify that these are, in fact, good values uh, to use. And if you have a, a refrigerator, or washing machine, anything that vibrates and you want to replicate it or find inspiration from it, you can do this yourself with, a, with an accelerometer that you already have access to. So in our car, uh, when our cars, we have this gear change effect. Um, when you're shifting gears, um, there's a small mismatch between the shaft speed and the transmission and the engine. And, um, and that can cause a little clunk that the user can feel. Um, this scales with how well you match the engine and transmission's RPM. So if they're doing a good job, uh, so someone asked what the fundamental frequency app is. So uh, there's a, a hundred of them out there. Um, just search for Fast Fourier Transform on your app store and you'll get a whole pile of them. So anyway, um, this clunk scales with how poorly you're shifting. So if you, you know, if you're, if you're in fifth gear and you try to stuff it into first gear, everybody, anybody who's driven a stick will know that your tires are going to lock up, the car's going to bounce around, it's going to be horrible. Um, so you need to match your engine and, and transmission RPMs correctly as you're shifting. So um, at the basic level, we can we can recreate this with a simple uh, en envelope trigger. So all we're going to do is uh, take the in, as an input our gear. We're going to stash that off. At, um, so that we know what the gear was last time we came through our loop. And if the gear changed, we're just going to trigger our envelope generator. And then we're just going to multiply our, engine, our envelope generator against a uh, uh, 40 hertz tone. Um, and we're always going to, so this is kind of key, is that we're always multiplying our envelope generator against the tone. We're not turning effects on and off. The effects are always running. We never turn them off. We're just turning their volumes on and off. Um, through the envelope generator in this case. Um, that, that's something as a programmer, I had to get my head around that, that everything runs all the time. Um, I'm sure as audio people, you, you all know that already. Um, so um, so this is easy peasy, right? This is a great way to trigger any sort of triggerable effect. You know, whatever, whatever you multiply against the envelope generator gets run. So you, if you have a loop of audio, if you, if you want a pure tone, whatever, you can just trigger it on and off. Um, in real life, we'd extend this out. Um, we would be looking at how poorly the shift happened. If we know anything about the hand force of the shift, um, we might add in gear grind effects, um, you know, and so on. Um, and this and this could be used for anything uh, that's a one shot. So particles, backfires, rock strikes, bullets, um, um, and it's it's nicer than the than the the. So because we're not having to ramp the effect on and off, it just happens automatically. We don't have to think about it. It's just a Boolean trigger. So it's very, it's very convenient. Um, so next we have a rev limiter. So in real race cars, the engines can't rev up super high. They, they, if you get to a certain RPM, the engine starts to tear itself apart. Um, so to prevent uh, people from just, you know, people from accidentally destroying their engine, um, they have a rev limiter built in that once the RPM gets above a certain point, they start cutting the fuel or the spark uh, to the engine, which cuts the power out. And then as the momentum uh, decreases and the engine RPM drops, then we turn the, the spark or the fuel back on and it starts up again. Um, and this creates a very low frequency uh, pulse sound, the wall, 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 as you're into the rev limiter. Um, but our... Base shakers aren't capable of producing these low frequency pulses. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we want to, you know, so in this case, we want to create a four hertz pulse. Um, and the shaker can't do that. The shaker can produce a 60 hertz pulse. So we're going to take our 60 hertz signal. We're going to multiply it against this four hertz signal. And the, we'll let the four hertz be the carrier wave and the 60 hertz will, uh, will be modulated based on that. Um, and that, that will create something that feels like a four hertz signal, but it, but it's in the frequency range that our shakers can handle. 
Um, so again, um, this is a, a Boolean effect. The limiter's on or it's off. Um, and we're going to, in this case, use our fade filter because it's not a one shot. We're not just turning it on and letting it run. We're, I mean, we're not just turning it on off quickly. We're, we want to turn it on and let it run as long as you're in the limiter. Um, so um, our fade filter just has the two effects, fade in or fade out. If, the limiter, if we're in the limiter, we just turn on the fade filter. And we don't need to worry um, about anything more than that. And then again, we're going to multiply our fade filter times our two frequencies um, to generate the effect. Now, in the past, when we've combined sine waves together, you might have noticed we had to divide through by some number to keep everything at unity. In this case, we don't have to because we're not adding things together. We're multiplying things together, right? So, uh, you know, the uh, a number one times a number one is still one. Nothing nothing increased, so we didn't add any energy into the system, whereas uh, adding 1 plus 1 is 2, so we've doubled the energy in the system. Um, so this works really well for pit speed limiters, ABS, or traction assists, or any other on-off effect. Um, so. so this is going to be our last effect that I'm going to talk about. Um, we have a lot more in our game. You're welcome to come check it out. Um, so when you're your tires are rolling over the ground. The surface of the ground at a macro level has really uh, is really random. It's just you know it's just little pieces of rock glued together. Um, so that generates a, a random vibration, which of course is just white noise. So this uh, vibration doesn't uh, it's white noise. It doesn't change frequency. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not like it's a pure tone. It's just, it's purely random. But it does have a, a change in timber based on the surface wear and the material type. Um, so, um, so we can recreate this with the white noise generator. And um, I'm not going to give you all the details here, but basically we're going to pass in something about the surface type and something about our speed. Um, so surface type might be something like uh, a coarse pavement or rough or smooth uh, concrete. Um, and then that'll just run through a series of lookup tables that we can use to generate um, the fundamental frequencies for each surface type. So as you transition from one type to the other, you'll feel, feel a different vibration uh, in the road as you're going along. So there's two effects here. Um, one of them is going to be just a white noise generator. And we're going to take a bandpass filter to, to to uh, try to color it a little bit. So the bandpass filter takes a center frequency and then it, you know, um, it's not shown, but you know, there's a width to the frequency that, that you have to adjust. Um, and so, you know, uh, really, uh, so asphalt might have a lower uh, center frequency than concrete because um, the grain size of the material is different. Um, so we're just gonna take our bandpass filter um, we're going to take our noise generator, generate some random noise, run it through our bandpass filter um, at the target frequency based on the material type, and, and that's done. Um, and then I'm adding in another effect here, um, and this is another way of using the sine waves. Um, it, we're taking two sine waves, one at a known frequency, and then another one at a very close frequency to it. And this is going to create a, a very rough interference. So if, if these two sine waves were very, very close together, in frequency, they would create a, 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 a pulse sound, you know, the wah, 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 like we did with a, with a rev limiter. But in this case, we've picked a, a frequency that is very dissonant so that they don't cancel each other out and they don't pulse, but instead they generate almost a random noise of their own, but at a very slow rate. Um, and this uh, adds more texture and roughness to it. So in this case, we're trying to simulate all the rocks and the you know, the, the bits of things that shouldn't be in the road that are there. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it's, you know, it's these are two effects that we, were combined together. Uh, so one of them is just these two sine waves, you know, with the amplitude set based on uh, some parameters. Um, and the other is white noise. And then together, this kind of creates a kind of a random rough texture. Um, now, we're again adding together sine waves, but this time everything's kind of random. Like we don't really know exactly what the gain should be. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to put this all together. We're going to just use it. And then we're going to open up a, a loopback program 
and watch the output signal and see what its gains are. Uh, you know, how, how loud did everything get as we added it all together? And then we're just going to estimate and come up with some normalizing factor based on uh, the output so that we can bring it back down to plus or minus one and get it ready for the final mix. Um, and, and the truth is that sometimes you just don't know exactly how uh, to normalize your signal and you're just going to have to go look at it and see what happens. So, all right. Um, so that's a very simple introduction to our system. Um, I, I didn't, I don't have a really great way of modeling this for you. You really need to feel it for yourself uh, with the base shaker. Um, in the in the in the um, in the forms for this event, I posted a little quick sample of audio that you can go play back yourself. But if you don't have a bass shaker, you probably won't hear much of anything. It's all very low frequency, but it's worthwhile um, to to try it out for yourself. And I highly recommend if you can uh, go try our game out and experiment it with it. It's it's much better in person to be able to really see how dynamic it is that bumping into things really gives you unique signals and it's not just a, a canned effect. So um, this was, um, so where do we go from here? Um, right now, this is all beginner stuff, right? We, we don't understand the hardware as well as we should. Um, so I put some effort into trying to figure out how to, how to compare base shakers together and figure out which, why one sometimes works better than another. Um, but there's a lot more work needed to be done there. Um, if we can get that right, then we can go back to the manufacturers of the hardware and say, hey, this is fidelity, you know, high enough fidelity, um, and, and hopefully get better and better quality hardware. Um, we as a community need to come up with better techniques for getting the most out of the hardware. I've shown you a couple tricks in here, but there's certainly plenty more tricks on how to get these things to work to the best of their ability within the limitations they have. Um, and then I really feel like this needs to become a common feature in game, the game. So players want, are, are eager to invest in their hardware as long as it gives them something back. You know, they'll be happy to spend a hundred dollars on a piece of hardware if um, a lot of the games they're using use it. If only one game uses it, then it's a hard sell to try to say, you know, go spend all this money, but nothing else is going to drive it. So uh, the more games that drive this stuff, the more interest there'll be in the community and the more hardware will be available. And you know, it's, it's a feedback loop. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to think about adding in some sort of a low frequency channel that's targeted at um, haptics into your game, however you go about doing it. Um, in the past, I think haptics has really been treated more as a gimmick. It's been given to some poor programmer to do. Uh, but the hardware is really capable of doing an awful lot. And I think uh, with with the right effort, you can really use it well to complement your audio. So on my end, um, where am I going next? Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm continually trying to grow this. So I've got uh, a growing number of devices attached to pedals. So I'm going to be creating more complicated effects that are targeted at each pedal. You know, so when your clutch is slipping, it might uh, play a rumble, or if you, your ABS brakes kick in, then the brake pedal might, might do something. Um, and I really feel like this is the future. Like, it, in my mind, this is kind of a poor man's motion platform. It really gives a lot of tactile feedback to the game. It brings it to life um, for a fairly low amount of money, compared to a motion platform, at least. So that's the end. Um, thanks for listening to my talk. Um, if you want to dig into this some more, there's some resources you can get access to. Um, I would highly recommend you read the papers, Do It Yourself Haptics, Part 1 and 2. Um, they're a very simple introduction to how you can make your own haptic devices, but also just understand the haptic concepts. Um, Stanford has several classes online that you can go view um, that are focused on haptics. And they're very high quality. Um, they're very technical, but I think you can handle them. Um, and then if you've never worked with DSPs and signal processing before, uh, especially if you're a programmer, um, the books, The Scientists and Engineers Guide to Digital Signal Processing is free online. And it's a very good introduction to DSPs. And I recommend you buy it from the author as well. It's, it's well worth the money. Um, and then that book is heavy on theory and light on practical. Um, it's all, all examples are in Visual Basic. Uh, 
So Will Perkle has the book Designing Audio FX Plugins um, and several other books that are more practical examples of how to actually generate DSPs and synthesizers. Um, and I think those two books together just kind of fill everything out. It makes a really great um, experience. So that's it for me. Um, if anybody has questions, I guess I could try to answer some. Otherwise, we'll be running out of time here soon. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come up, so I think I'll uh, we'll cut it off here. And you guys have a great day and go out and make things shake. Thanks for listening.